rock time. A Coralie question in the chat. What kinds of rocks are these that we are seeing? So these are basaltic rocks that are coated in ferromanganese crust and then have a light dusting of marine snow. The light dusting of marine snow. Or cobalt-rich crusts. Yeah, right? or you could call them cobalt-rich crusts. They originally started calling them cobalt rich crust because they were thought to they, because they do have a large concentration of cobalt comparative to other reservoirs. Uh, but compared to how much iron and manganese there are in these crusts, which is way more than the amount of cobalt they have, they changed the name to ferromanganese. A little bit more scientific. We've got a starfish. Yep. Oop. This is a hymenaster, also known as the slime star. A tour of every camera in <laughs> super high speed. <laughs> 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 the whole expedition just flashed before my eyes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Janelle, it's it's uh, your quiz from Trevor. See if you can fly while everything's flashing. You're just testing rocks. So, Megan, this is a great observation on the chat. Um, all the cutthroat eels we've seen uh, seem to be solitary. Did they ever have any type of social groupings or like feeding groups? Oh, uh, that's a good question. Um, not sure, but say if you were to um, bring some fish down here and leave a baited camera, you would see an, an aggregation of these cutthroat eels come to feed on the fish that are at the baited camera. So they will come together to feed if there's a lot of food. Um, it'll be a party. But I'm not exactly what they do socially, what what kind of parties they throw, um, what kind of cocktails they bring. So we're seeing some uh, Rumilla gorgia militaris. Those are those big white corals with the lyrate branching where all the polyps line up in a row. We had been seeing those on the other two seamounts that we surveyed at the same depth. So it's interesting to note that we are also seeing them here. Video DJ Aaron, um, some lovely imagery we're seeing. Do you have to recalibrate the video after flying through the water column? Um, we've decided not to because we're at the same depth, um, basically, that we left at. Um, and it does take quite a bit of time, and we're going to rock samples. So that was our combined decision from the front row. So if we went to a radically different depth, though, would you have yeah. to recalibrate? I would, yeah. I would recalibrate the lens. We're not going to be zooming there. Sorry, I can't hear you. I, I was just looking at the rocks. Oh, Roger. I was like, ooh, that one looks loose. Oh, there's a shrimp. Oh.
to okay to be that or right right gotcha okay 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 or oh, shrimp came back hello shrimp Nice bright red orange. Yeah, we see a lot of shrimps uh, that color down here. They all seem to be that red orange color. And you'd think they'd all be the same, but it turns out most of them are different. So that makes it very difficult to identify them. The characters that you're looking at when you're identifying shrimps are usually their rostrum, which is that sort of. Um, horn like spine that's between the eyes okay other things you might look at are uh, mouth parts or spines on the carapace bonk. you might be looking at their pleopods or swimming legs i love the term mouth parts mouth parts they have lots of mouth parts they have a set of three maxillipeds so mouth arms Okay. Okay. Do you want me to hold? Or are you you good? These are some large boulders. Uh, on such a steep slope. Oh yeah. Goodness. I can still move, but I'm almost at the end of my leash. No. Spotting more of those oh, Melagorgia and then a, a sea cucumber on one of the rocks. Roger. Saw one of those large Actinostolidae anemones. Yep. Gotcha. I thought we were at 220. So, we, I mean, that's where we want to go. I'm sorry. I'm not trying to be... I don't know if I'm being helpful or not. <laughs> Just to let the folks at home know, I am seeing the ROV questions in the chat, but we're going to hold those for a little bit while the uh, pilots do their thing. Oh, is that a little shrimpy in the Argus view? Yeah. Just thinking of climbing that wall, you know, like the rock walls. Be amazing. Yeah, some of these areas are pretty steep. It could be really challenging if you weren't in an ROV. Driving, floating up. You had to like climb each boulder. And some of this material look, looks like it would uh, be really crumbly and hard to walk on. Yeah, um, Coralie, you were mentioning that the samples that you had were, were they crumblier than you expected? Uh, not crumblier than I expected. They were crumblier as I expected. 
<laughs> they're as crumbly as expected. Got yeah, it. I've been working with these samples. Um, I've been working with samples from two Nautilus cruises, uh, NA-110 and NA-114 for past year and a half. So I've gotten very used to how crumbly these samples are. So I was expecting about the same level of crumbliness. Ooh, what rock is the hardest rock? Is it still diamond? Am I still hip? Yes, diamond is the hardest mineral. Uh, it's on the most scale of hardness. It's a 10. And your fingernail is about at a 2. Could there ever be anything harder than a diamond? Why not? I mean, we got the diamond, right? If those aliens from that Rihanna sci-fi movie come down, oh, then maybe dear. there might be a little oh, okay. harder yeah, yeah. than ten. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, carbon's crazy. It's like cheap and like you know graphite, and then you put it under immense temperature and pressure, and then it's a diamond, and it's really expensive. It's because it's, it's hard expensive to because we make it expensive. Or, yeah. Huh? It's expensive because we've decided it's expensive, though. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's all about supply and demand. Bah humbug. You could just buy cubic zirconia. No one would know the difference. Literally, no one would know the difference. Except for a geologist. <laughs> yeah, but you'd have to like look at like take the ring off the person's finger and like inspect it. I don't know that many geologists, though, that care about diamonds. I think most geologists have favorite minerals, and they're generally... I've never heard of a geologist saying their favorite mineral is a diamond. They just like the diamond for cutting things? Yeah. Uh, it's how nice to do science with. Yeah. Like how does uh, obsidian rate on that scale? Oh, I love obsidian. Dragon glass for all the Game of Thrones watchers out there. Stop it. <laughs> Do you but know, uh, how Thrones? I've never seen it um, or read show. it either. Uh, how hard is it on the on the hardness scale, though? Oh, I don't know. It's a glass. It's um, I don't know. We don't really consider it a mineral because it's a glass, but oh, okay. I guess it could be considered a mineral. Uh, it's mostly made up of silica, though, so probably somewhere along the lines of quartz. I think quartz is seven. I can't remember. Let me look it up. The thing I like about obsidian is the conchoidal fracture. That's my geology term for the day. <laughs> Good job. I'm a fan of sodalite myself. I love the, the blue and white mixed together. I like olivine. Does it, I love olivine. Yeah. It's pretty cool. You can see a lot of it at the green sand beach. That's what makes the sand green. Oh, someone actually asked in the chat what our favorite mineral was, and we're just already talking about it anyway. Yeah, so. we're just... Yeah. <laughs> My favorite mineral is actually pyrite. Uh, fool's gold. Pyrite's awesome. Yeah, it, like, comes in, like, this really cubic... The way it's, um, like, forms is in this really cubic shape, which is really cool. Um, and then also it's fool's gold, so I like that it has a little element of you know, sneakiness. My, like, little, you know, those kits that you get, it's like a book and uh, stuff. Mm -hmm. like that. It's like in the little plastic section, so I had a rock kit, like a, a rock book, and it came with some fool's gold and some other stuff. I was like, oh, okay. they wouldn't give us real gold, surely? No. And yes, <laughs> I was right. Quartz is a seven on the most hardness scale, so with one, you have talc, two, you have gypsum, three, you have calcite, four, you have fluorite, Five, you have appetite. Six, you have help spelled spar. Seven, you have quartz. Eight, you have topaz. Nine, you have corundum. And ten, you have diamond. Topaz is awesome. How much do you have to eat if you have appetite? <laughs> <laughs> Can we find any of these on the deep sea floor? Can, or is that a question? Yeah. Oh. She's just making faces back <laughs> I here. Thought, I thought you were saying you can find any of these on the deep sea floor. Yeah, you can. Um, 
you can definitely find quartz down here, feldspar, calcite, obviously. So um, there's a lot of calcite in the ocean because you need it to make these calcium carbonate shells. Front row, do we have time for an ROV question? Time for an ROV question. All right, I have had two. Does Hercules have a rear view camera for reversing? Oh yeah, and side view mirror cameras too. Herc has many, many cameras. Herc has so many cameras. Mm -hmm. Does it make a little beeping sound as it's going backward? Uh, it makes the same beeping sound when it goes forward. <laughs> <laughs> and it sounds like <laughs> <laughs> Yep. For all of you wondering where all the fish are. <laughs> there are 35 <laughs> cameras between all the the ROV cameras and the cap the cameras on the boat. 35? That's it? I thought there would be more. Yeah, yeah including 35. the cameras on the boat. Okay. Uh, on the, yeah, on the ship. Cool. Yep. Uh, second question. Do increased forces of gravity at deeper depths require unique ROV handling skills? So no. Increased depth. forces of gravity. I don't, yeah, that's... The, the water makes it, makes things floaty. Yeah. More floaty, yeah. It's after, it's after dinner. I'm, my brain is shutting down. <laughs> Wait, what's the question? <laughs> Basically, uh, do you require uh, more unique or unique ROV handling skills in uh, deep sea as opposed to uh, shallow? Oh, the difference in shallow to deep is negligible. Um, it's non-zero but it's negligible. It's more based on salinity of the water than it is anything else. Salinity and temperature, I should say. But I guess a good question would be, do we have to set up the ROV differently if we're planning a shallow dive versus a deep dive? Uh, set up the ROV differently? He uh, just, just boots it out into the water. Yeah, be free. Kick yeah. her over the side, she'll be fine. Sink or swim. Uh, do you change oil uh, if we're planning a lot of shallow dives or just use the same? Hey, you know what? That's a really good question. That's hit the nail on the head. Yeah, we put less oil in it if it's shallow. because Not because it gets less squeezed, but because it's hotter. So the moving bits heat up the oil, which expands. And it can expand too much if it doesn't get cooled by the ocean. So down here, it's 1 or 2 degrees Celsius, and on the surface, it's 25 to 30 uh, in tropical regions, so a big difference. Is there a minimum depth that Hercules can work at? 0 0.1 meters. Nice. No, no, there's no real minimum depth. <laughs> <laughs> Although, I feel like there's a better option than just like letting it float at the sea's surface, like videoing things. Maybe something a little smaller, like an AUV. Yeah, well, overheating could be a problem, so you got to ask these qu kinds of questions. That was a great question. And, uh, yeah, we just kind of answered how salinity and temperature affect the ROV. Yep. You want to start thinking about a rock? Oh, do I? Are we there? There's so many rocks. We did want to get a rock when we got to this side of the seamount. Yeah, about 2,700 meters. You wanted it to be at exactly 2,700? Yes. Okay. Also, a uh, smaller rock would probably be better because all of the boxes are full and I still need to get three more rock water pairs afterwards. So a small rock, you say? Small rock. Small rock. That's Trevor's specialty. Small rock? Let's get the biggest rock possible. That's what do we I have heard. a crowbar yeah. on, on Hercules? No, crowbars don't really do much. You'd be surprised. You end up moving the vehicle more than the rock. That makes total sense since we are in the water. We've looked into hydraulic rock breakers, but never actually followed through. Oh. That would be sweet. 
Yeah, how did that groupie hand um, thing that you guys are testing out work out? Groupie hand thing? I don't know. Yeah. The claw that JPL the, yeah, brought the giant out. Oh, claw. like, what, three years ago or something? Yeah, that was that was a while back. Yeah, that was for a specific purpose. That was not really for grabbing the rocks. It was more for attaching to the rock for a core drill, for rock core sampling, which they didn't have the drill on board, but they had the uh, grabby bit. And it worked good, I think. What I could understand, it seemed to do what they expected it to do. That's cool. Um, there are some Hercules specification questions. So um, to find out more about our ROVs, you just head to nautiluslive.org. On the homepage, uh, just to the down a little bit and to the right, we've got a section called Live Data, and it shows pictures of both ROVs. All you have to do is click on one of them nice. to view its information. Um, so Hercules' max depth is about 4,000 meters. Lots of rock puns in the chat. Oh, look at him. Oh, nice, vibrant purple. Well, it's off the screen now. It was over to the right. A little... Oh, you're talking about the sea cucumber? Yeah. Yeah. Somebody in the chat said Hercules, more like Hercules. I love that movie. Loving these big boulders. Yeah, let's try and grab one of those. Big rock, small rock, I hear everything. <laughs> small rock, please. Small rock, please. They oh. say small rock, but they really mean big rock. Do you have one in mind that you can circle? Okay, let me look. They are chunkers. It's hard to see the scale of uh, when we pick things up at sea, but most of the rocks that we're picking up are... Two-handers, for sure. Well, did you know, Avery, we got uh, those scaling oh, lasers. Oh, yeah, the They're 10 centimeters apart. Something in this We region. do. <laughs> we have two little green. They're not on the screen Somewhere right now. So you're they just are, oh, yeah. Oh, they are. Really oh, I see them. To find. Yep. So they are 10 centimeters apart, but still, you know, you can't, like, feel that in your hands. Totally like, looking at this giant thing. Ah, can you keep sea cucumbers as pets? Oh, wouldn't that be nice? They're like uh, water balloons. Right. Um, yeah, you could have sea cucumbers in your shallow water tank, like if you were keeping shallow water sea cucumbers. It could be difficult to keep deep sea sea cucumbers. Magic um, bubble just to see the craft. because that's yeah. a, a much more challenging tank to run. Okay, this is but yeah, yeah, you could have sea cucumbers in your tank, and, and they could help you clean up the sediment. Um, it could be challenging to feed them. Oh, my oh, gosh. Too big. That one's too way big. too big. There's nothing else here, I don't think. Maybe this one? Oh. That's so unfortunate. It's probably because we're at uh, 2,699 oh, okay. meters. Is that too big or is that all right? Uh, okay, can we try and put it please? in... Can we try and put it in starboard D? Sure. We can succeed in putting it in starboard D. How about that? There is something already in it, but I think it's deep enough. Oh, yeah. Okay, can you s switch my cameras around, please? Uh, do you want sample? Uh, no, I want the other camera turned on. Sure. Come wide, please, Aaron. Oh, bonk. Hm. You're going to have to come off bottom for this one. Okay. Turns out there was a cliff wall right there. Oh, yeah. Oh, still is. Hey, don't steal that from me. Sorry. 
Not you. <laughs> the rock face. Oh, the rock. I was trying to pull the rock out of my jaws. Okay, you can open the box. I'm good without oh. that. Delta? Delta. Okay. Oh, Oops, stay in there, spongy. That was zero six two. Uh, zero six two. Zero six two. So are we loud enough on the box? Yeah, that's good. Okay. Are we niskinning as well? Probably. Can you camera rack back, please. I see the Niskins. Uh, no, no Niskin sample. No Niskin sample. No Niskin, no Niskin sample. Oh, ah, just when we okay. thought we understood. <laughs> Did you do one? Nope. Okay, good. All right, do hang out there for a moment if you can. Okay. I missed the last opportunity. Do you want me to land or uh, just hang out? You don't have to. Just hang out. That. All right, resetting. And switching your master position source to dead wreck. Okay. And you can put your camera back out if you haven't already. All right, we should nice. be good to go. Okay, cool, cool. We good? Yep. Awesome. You ready for a move? Um, yeah. All right. No, Niskin. Bridge nav. <laughs> Can we get five zero You're meters so two two zero? So why no water sample this time, Coralie? Um, because I want to collect that higher up. So the last sample was supposed to be taken at um twenty seven oh nine meters, um, and that was the last watch or some one of the watches before us. And I guess Adam didn't like the rock that they collected. <laughs> so he wanted to get another one at 2,700 meters. Um, but I want one higher up because the next rock I want to collect is going to be at 2,300 meters. Uh, it's going to be at 2,380 is what I'm hoping for. Um, and I want, uh, I want the oxygen to be different enough. So if we just can collect another Niskin they're probably the oxygen content of the water is going to be really similar and I want to have a variety and where are the next two Niskins going to happen is that to me yeah uh up up higher even still yeah well the next sample I want to collect I don't think we'll be able to make it but I want to collect one at 2380 right 2380 and then we get two more Niskins after that yeah so it's 2380, 2050, and then at the summit. Oh, yeah. Okay. Not believe in magic, Coralie. Sure, we can make the next one mm -hmm. with an R watch, right? Right? We would have to go really fast. Yeah. Then we wouldn't get to stop and look at the corals. Where there's a will, there's a way. <laughs> there's no will anymore. We fired him. <laughs> <laughs> Fine. If you believe it, you can achieve it. Right. Uh, ship life question. Do we struggle with seasickness? Their dream is exploration, deep sea exploration, but they struggle with motion sickness. Everybody's different. Navigation, not navigation, sorry. Video, Aaron, you don't seem to get seasick, correct? Nope. I have gotten seasick once, but oh, I was you? on a tiny sailboat in the middle of the South Atlantic. And it was like, for oh, about an hour. Seasick. Yeah, I think everyone gets it mildly. Like, I get really sleepy at the beginning of each um, cruise and stuff, and that is like a mild sign of seasickness. Um, 
but I adjust quite quickly. I grew up on boats too, which was nice. That being said, so did my sister and she gets seasick. So really it just, it's kind of the luck of the draw. Zoom in please, Erin. And I, All right, we ooh. have this wonderful yellow sponge. This is a bolosoma. We've been calling this one species B until it can be described. So what's the difference between this and like an ET sponge? So they are in the same subfamily, but they are in different uh, gen uh, genuses. So that stalk is like neon yellow. Yeah. What's, what's usually, isn't one, it? So a lot of times when we see animals um, with bright colors, it's because they have these volatile uh, compounds in their tissue, and that usually helps deter predation or um, might have some sort of function for the animal. But we're not exactly sure why the sponge is bright yellow. It's interesting to see it on the stalk rather than on the spongy bit itself. Yeah, usually the spongy bit is more yellow. Um, but yeah, that one wasn't as yellow, which is interesting. It could just be that that compound didn't get concentrated at the top. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. Uh, what makes a sponge an animal? Because it can't be a plant. <laughs> There's no photosynthesis down here, right? Right, yeah. So we don't have any plants this deep because there is no light. So all the large organisms that we're seeing are animals, with the exception of Sometimes we see these anim um, critters known as xenophyophores, and they're actually single cellular organisms that create a test. And if I see one, I'll point it out, but they're protists. Uh, sure, yeah, I don't know, sure. Um, on the seasickness thing, there are people on board that do get seasick, and they yes. they just keep working. Um, it just depends on how m much you can tolerate and um, how much you want to do it, I guess. It's a mixture, um, and if it's physically possible, because if you're so seasick that you can't get out of bed, then that's obviously not going to be great. We have a poor intern on board right now who has been seasick this entire time, and some days she's better, some days she's worse, but... She loves it, so she's gonna keep doing it. Who's that? What? I'm Actually, not gonna zoom name in on this names. Little white oh. thing, Aaron? Yep, I, I can yeah, zoom, in. zoom this like little, little time, white though. guy. Ooh. So barnacle? this is actually a uh, gooseneck barnacle. Yes. I'm landed. Hang Correctly on. identified. I'm learning yeah, things. Everybody's getting the hang of it. The name for this barnacle, um, I believe, it's in the genus Alcacianum. Now, we saw something that looked more like the barnacles that are on the, uh, closer to the surface, I think, earlier today, right? So they both hang out down here? Yeah, so there, there are a bunch of different types of barnacles that we might see in the deep sea. Um, they come in two main forms. Um, you have those gooseneck-type barnacles, and then your very typical attaching to rocks types of barnacles. And so you'll see those barnacles on rocks and also on corals and sponges. Uh, yeah. Now this is a question that I can see happening in my brain because sometimes they look the same to me. Um, they're asking the difference between the the stars that you know that have like kind of feathery bits or brittle stars and uh, coral that also look kind of similar, like the. Um, like feather stars and like the more feathery coral. Like what's the difference between a coral and a star? So corals are in the phylum Cnidaria and feather stars are in the phylum Echinodermata. So they are completely different animal groups. And corals often live in colonies. So like this Pleurogorgia militaris, each polyp is an individual and they live in a colony. Whereas feather stars or sea stars are a singular animal 
and those animals have internal organs. Ooh, what's the difference between Argus and Hercules? Argus is attached directly to the boat and it is less complex structure, more of a, it's a it, and it's Zoom weighted. In on this little Whereas Hercules uh, has manipulator Orange arms gyre. and cameras and is actually floats in the water if you let it. Sorry? That's the simple answer. Yep. So right now we are zooming in on a coral and a sponge. So the little white sponge right here is a bo another bolosoma. And then this is a norella that has the V shape as a type of coral known as a primnoid coral. And you can ID this coral by looking at the polyps. The polyps on this coral all Here. have scales okay. along the main body of the polyp. And Norella always have a set of three scales on the body. And when those polyps close, they close in a downward direction. Are there active thermal vents on this chain of seamounts? No. Are there? Nope. No. This is an, an ancient ancient seamount chain. Yeah. It's pretty old, so there's not a lot of hydrothermal activity, or really any at all. What was the thing you circled back there? Oh, right here. There was, oh, well, so big. Where are you? Right there. Uh, right there? It, okay. I believe it's a bamboo coral. Can you zoom in, please, Aaron? Oh, good eye. Yeah, I only saw it because uh, it looked like something moved a little bit across the rocks. Oh, shrimpy. And there's a tiny shrimp. So this is a nice little bamboo coral. It is unbranched. It's one of the uh, types of corals that we see most frequently at these depths, along with the primnoid corals okay. and chrysogorgia corals. Sounds good. Roger. Yep. Okay. Well, we've gotten ourselves into a sticky situation here. Is a Venus flytrap an animal because it eats meat? So yeah, the the not the the only distinction between um, animal and plant is not just sunlight, correct? Because there's sponges that are that function kind of like Venus flytraps, right? But a Venus flytrap is a plant. Uh, so there's a Venus flytrap anemone, right. um, and it's. It's not a plant. Um, we only call it that because it sort of resembles the plant in some way, the way the tentacles are arranged around the outside of the animal. But no, uh, there are no plants down here. The main things that we're looking at um, that di differentiate plants from animals are usually photosynthesis. Um, nothing down here is going to photosynthesize because there is no light. Um, Can you give me a snap zoom on this little also like thingy? cell walls? Uh, plants have a, a rigid cell wall, whereas animals Oops, will not have that rigid cell wall. Back. Ah, lost it. Um, come on, thank you. Oh, sorry, guy. Oh no. Ooh. Okay. Here's a deep question: Do sponges and coral think? they have a brain? How do they communicate? Do they think? Well, they don't think in the same way that you and I might think. Um, they're not making decisions in the way that even, say, your dog might make a decision. Um, but there is some rudimentary intelligence, I believe. Uh, the animal has you know, objectives, and, and like every animal, 
and that is to eat and reproduce. And so the animal will do its best to achieve those two goals. And it will change the way it's oriented or its shape um, in order to best uh, find food in the environment, for example. So uh, a lot of corals and sponges have a sort of plastic morphology, which means that they can uh, grow in a certain way that will allow them the, the best opportunity to get food. And that's why you'll see that a lot of these corals are all facing in the same direction. Um, and that likely is indicative of the direction of the current. So corals facing perpendicular to the current are going to be more likely to capture more food because more water is passing by them and across near their polyps. If they were parallel to the current, uh, you'll have it. Most of that water is going to pass by them without flowing through the branches. Hmm. An example for sponges is you see these sponges have these long stalks. They might grow their stalks longer in order to get higher up off the seafloor where there's more turbulent flow, which will give them more opportunity to gather food. Some of those bolosoma sponges have that open osculum. They'll face that osculum into the current so the water gets funneled through that osculum and out uh, through the tissues. Oh, Megan, would you let the robot steal your job? This asks if you could train AI recognition to help identify things among crowds of rocks to look at in more detail, would you? Can I just say that AI is not... <laughs> uh, robots are great, and we have made a lot of advancements, but they don't work as awesome as you think they do. <laughs> Maybe someday they will. Yeah, so we're currently in the process of training a computer to find and identify organisms. And in some cases, it does do a decent job finding things, but not so good a job at identifying those things. Uh, the human brain is just really good at recognizing these patterns that we haven't yet gotten to the point to entrain uh, a computer to do that same thing. So I think it's going to be a while before um, a computer is going to be able to do the taxonomic work and identification work that I've been doing when annotating video. But it would be really nice if uh, I could have a computer help me out by finding scenes that have corals. So. If we have, for example, uh, a computer program that sa says, I think that this is something important, and then I can come in and say, yes, that thing is Rumilla Gorgia militaris. And it says, this is something important. And I say, yes, that is a shrimp. And eventually, over time, uh, I think the computer will be able to differentiate things like, is it a coral? Is it a shrimp? But then there comes the time when you might have really small details uh, that maybe a computer can't differentiate between uh, a shrimp because it swims in a certain way. And that's what I'm basing my ID off of. So there's a lot more than just uh, one visual picture that goes into my ID. It's a lot of watching these types of videos and seeing what's here. Um, I also base some of my IDs off of what I know from this area at this depth. So even if I can't see something very well, like, for example, this little coral, we haven't zoomed in on it, but I know that that's a Chrysogorgic coral. It's likely in the genus Chrysogorgia. Ooh, can we, can we zoom this guy right here? Let's zoom in on it. Yeah. Good luck. This is a Munopsid isopod. For the far away zoom. Oh, yeah, we saw one just oh, when we well touched down. Work. Sorry. Yeah, they're really, um, really cool. I'm going to be hung up on this rock. Ay, ay, ay. 
It just looks like it always uh, floats down when we're all panning up. Again. Oh, no. Goes. Sorry. When we saw one before, um, you know, it was just kind of sprawled out, but that was just like perfectly vertical, just like hanging out like it was asleep or something, and then just like burst out. Yeah, so they'll, they'll open and close their legs in order to sort of slow down, speed up, and sink. And they have little hairs along their legs called cilia that, that'll help them float and, and uh, drift with the current. Roger. Is there deep water fungi the world may never know? We really don't know. But you can become a scientist and study about it. Yeah, we still haven't Googled if uh, there are deep water fungi. I'm partial to saying yes, that there are some. Why not? But I don't really know about fungus in the ocean. Why are you partial to saying yes? Like, what is your... Well, because it seems like fungi is everywhere, so why wouldn't it be? I mean, yeah, I agree. I agree. <laughs> But, uh, we thought there was a better reason than like why know, not. I don't know. <laughs> I really because don't. They're here and here. I like, so maybe they're here. All every day, I just realize that there's so many things that I don't know, and I find it really exciting because that means that I can always learn something new. I think my favorite quote from you was, uh, "We we know what it's not." Yep. <laughs> Sometimes that's all I can uh, provide <laughs> is I just I know what it isn't. Yeah. Um, so, would these sponges be heavily affected by decompression if they're brought closer to the surface? Would they survive closer to the surface? Um, I don't think decompression is going to affect the sponge, uh, but the temperature change would definitely affect the sponge, so it probably wouldn't survive a trip to the surface. No. Uh, shallower water um, animals might survive a trip. Sometimes we get back um, some amphipods or polychaetes that are still alive and when they reach the surface and they're zooming around, uh, but they usually don't live particularly long. Yeah. Nice pun. Every place needs a fun guy, so there's totally fun guy everywhere. <laughs> uh, do we ever feel like we're exploring another planet? That actually is a good observation because um, a lot of uh, ROV or underwater operations are studied for space travel. Mm -hmm. So they're very similar, um, I won't say environments, but similar kind of things where you might have to do things remotely or on a team that's in different locations or exploring things you haven't seen before. I mean, it is like a whole new world down here. You can, you can feel like you're on another planet um, by doing this type of work. But what's really amazing is that it is our planet, and we know so little about this place in the planet. Oh, look at Gaza Daedala, the flailing snail, as I like to call it. Oh. Um, other people call it the dancing snail, the swimming snail. Acrobatic what? snail? Acrobatic, yeah, totally. Man, look, look at him go. go. So the snail uh, uses its foot to sort of just leap <laughs> over the rocks. Bonk, bonk, bonk. <laughs> That's quite fun. It's <laughs> very fun, yeah. Also, did you just say that we take deep sea for granite? Yeah, we do. This is basalt. <laughs> <laughs> yep. The follow-up really nailed it home there. <laughs> 
I just solid I was delivery. Say it, but then I got distracted by the snail. Yeah, <laughs> it was a good lead up. Yeah, and I don't always tell fish puns, but when I do, I do it for the halibut. Uh. And there's a request, Coralie. Uh, when you mark the fungi joke, uh, would you please not put them in the trash and debris, but in the rare finds folder? <laughs> <laughs> okay. We don't have <laughs> a folder for that, but I can put it in bio. <laughs> there was a question, or was it? Oh, about currents. Uh, how fast can the current get at the bottom? Do what? I don't believe we have a great way of measuring the current down below, do we? I think you can measure um, it with... Yeah, we can measure yeah. it sort of with the ROV, just based on how much thrust uh, they need to move forward or doing a drift test. Um, but no, we don't have anything down here that's actively measuring the currents. Um, yeah, you can I believe the ship port. has an ADCP. Oh, okay. But that doesn't go this deep. Yeah, I was going to say you can measure currents with Argus floats, but I think you'd have to, I don't know how deep they go. You'd have to get one that can go pretty deep. Yeah. And if you were going to do a study on uh, deep sea currents, and um, especially in areas where you have high density corals and you want to know what's a good current for uh, this community to thrive, what kind of patterns are you seeing in the current throughout the year? You might want to put down um, an ADCP uh, current logger in order to measure currents over at least the course of a year because currents change quite frequently throughout the day and over courses of months. And so uh, just getting a measurement one snapshot of time while we're here on this very day isn't really informative about what the current is like in this community over time, which is really important to understanding how much food might be getting to these animals. So here's a bit of a historic question. Um, a viewer was reminded, oh, the, uh, the coral stalks, the dead coral stalks we saw in the uh, earlier seamounts, they're reminded of the great storm in England in 87 when all the trees were felled in the same direction. So they were wondering if all of those corals might have been uprooted by a large event at some point. I mean, it's possible. Um, there could have been an event where, like, especially where, when we were seeing those really large sponges everywhere, but then we didn't see any higher up that those sponges existed a long time ago, and some event um, caused them to die off at similar times is, is a possibility. Uh, we'll never know what exactly went on to cause them all to be where we found them. But yeah, that's a good theory. There's a question of that. Uh, it continues on if it might have been a meteor strike. Again, if a meteor strike caused such disruption in the deep ocean, I think the rest of the world would have something more concerning to be worried about. It would have destroyed, I don't know, like a large chunk of the world, probably. Yeah. Is that a is that a bathy pathy? Yeah, bathy -pathy. it's a bath of pathies. I wasn't quite sure when I circled it what it was. <gasps> what? You weren't sure? Well, I like had an idea, but like I like to look at things. It's best not to jump to the conclusions. Oh, there's a pun on there somewhere. We'll find it eventually. And then uh, over to the left, there was this sort of kind of weird looking coral that was very squiggly. Yeah, this this one. Up on the top there? Uh, this, this one here. Okay. okay. On the right. Sort of like a, a weird sparse branching bamboo maybe? It, it just looks like a, a little stick in, man. Sort of waving. Yeah, it's going to be hard to see the base. Impossible. Okay. Trying to figure out where exactly it, it's branching from. 
Is it from the middle or, or near lower down? Yeah, it's hard to tell. Looks like it's two that are like crossed over. Yeah, it's, like it's crisscrossing. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, that was good. Sorry, I have to read this out loud because it actually made me chuckle. Is there any pepper next to the basalt? Because it's just so <laughs> bad. <laughs> so, that took me a little bit too long to understand before I got it. The first time I read it, I was like, a, a ba pepper? What is a ba pepper? Ooh, here's a nice new black coral. This is a parantopathies. Uh, do we ever find that looking at rocks is similar to looking at clouds in the sense that you can see shapes? Yeah, Coralie was seeing faces earlier. Yeah, I mean, you can see a face or a shape in anything if you try hard enough, right? Like, that looks like a hippo. Uh, mm -hmm. if sure. You ever, <laughs> if you ever look at the three-pronged three uh, uh, plugs, wall plugs, oh, yeah, yeah, it looks like, like a little faces. face going like, oh. <laughs> yeah, we have some right here. <laughs> yeah, they're all in distress, like some of them are laying sideways. It's like that emoji that's like... <gasps> Speaking of, what Sorry. do corals even get stressed out about? Current, Current events. events. Yeah. <laughs> I like that one. What is the most taxing part of working as a team? It's the pun pressure. Yep. <laughs> all right. Speaking of pun pressure, what kind of seafood can you get in saunas? In saunas? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Steamed mussels. Aww. Uh, I had a friend in undergrad who, before he would work out, he would go into the sauna for 30 minutes, and that he included that as part of his workout. How long was the total workout? I think an hour. <laughs> and so he was in there like half an hour? Yeah. I thought you were supposed like to that. do that after the workout. Yeah, I thought that was an after the workout. He did it before because it warms up your muscles and it increases your heart rate. So then you start working out with a higher heart rate. I guess. Oh, that makes you sense. have to bring it up manually. Oh, sort mm. of like hot yoga? Yeah. So or what? smarter, not harder. There's a pun in there too somewhere. Um, what drew you to the ocean and wanting to explore the unknown of it? Uh, when I was little, I used to watch like those like Nova specials on like the deep sea and the deep and deep space. So those are my two favorite things. I also picked up rocks in the park and sometimes seashells and sometimes acorns. So I like finding things and exploring the unknown and like I just think it's awesome when you look out into the vastness of like deep sea or deep space like what is over there yeah i agree i was that kid that was always bringing home little bugs and yeah. things from the yard his pockets and, full of stuff yeah and the first time i saw tide pools and all the animals that live in tide pools up in the on the coast of maine uh that was when i was like this is really cool. And then I met a marine biologist on a whale watching tour, and I realized that that was a job that someone would pay you to do. I'm like, oh, okay, that's what I'm going to do. Yeah, I'm going to be a marine biologist. Yeah, when I was younger, I used to collect rocks, nice. and I thought they were so cool. And even like when you would go to like one of those places, and then it ha you'd buy like a bag for $5, uh -huh. and you could fill it up with all those different kinds of rocks. Oh, I, I thought that was things. so much fun. I have one still, like yeah. from when I was in like Ocean Shores or something. And I had this whole collection of little rocks. And then I also had this friend when I was younger. And she came over and she said, I shouldn't collect rocks because they're too boring. And so then I started collecting keychains. But now what do I do? I'm still <laughs> collecting rocks. I'm sorry. I'm in your on. face, Gina. <laughs> you, you collected keychains? Yeah, I started like from Claire's. Like there would be like little like bear keychains. And sometimes it'd be like, stupid oh, Gina. <laughs> <laughs> You showed her. <laughs> Wonder what she's doing now. Yeah. Probably collecting keychains like probably a shrunk. <laughs> <laughs> probably she's probably, probably she's breaking probably other like children's dreams. <laughs> Your dreams like are working stupid. At Claire's. Shut up, Gina. <laughs> working at Claire's doing like bad piercing jobs. Uh, Back piercing? Bad piercing. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Hey, I got my ears pierced at Claire's. Same here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I had my ears pierced the first time with like the piercing gun and it that that was fun.